Let me just move this up. Oh, hi. Uh, this is Arthur with the two-on-one project. Hey, things have been a little crazy, both in the country and in the life of Spiff and myself. So we are representing an episode that we really loved. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler came to talk to us about what the Constitution means to me. It's a conversation from October of 2020, and it's still relevant, perhaps even more relevant today. So I do want to remind you that Advent is coming and that we are sponsored by one of the most advantageous people there are, Jeff Warner Designs. Jeff Warner Designs is celebrating 17 years of making ordinary time extraordinary through liturgical textiles, that's stoles, that's pyramids, that's banners, that's frontals, that's chasubles, copes, and the occasional miter and liturgical face mask. You can find out more about Jeff One Row at Jeff One Row, J-E-F-F-W-U-N-R-O-W.com. But do so after today's show. Take a listen, and we'll be back with you soon. We are. Okay. Uh, so, Spiff, uh, or Stephanie, I mean, I call you Spiff, and people call you Spiff. Let's talk about our sponsor, Jeff One Row Designs. When do you want to talk about how for 15 years Jeff One Row Designs has been making ordinary times extraordinary? I do. And also, or I would like do you want to talk to folks about how Jeff One Row Designs makes beautiful liturgical textiles, processional banners, frontals, pyramids, stoles, chasubles, coves, and other vestments? I really do. Also, I want to. Or do you want to talk about how Jeff One Row Designs is a proud ecumenical partner with the ELCA, UMC, UCC, DOC, PCUSA, and every other active acronym, <laughs> including the Episcopalians and the Roman Catholics and the Unitarian clients? I, I do. And oh, okay. Yes, all of that. And for 15 years, Jeff One Row Designs has been making, designing, crafting these exquisite items that enhance and inform worship for pastors and congregations all over the place. This stuff is good. Of course it's good. That is why we are so proudly and gratefully sponsored by them. Exactly. We would not solicit sponsorship from businesses we don't admire and want to promote. I have three steps, three stoles by Jeff One Row, not adverse to a fourth. They're beautiful, intricate, solidly made, and a worthy investment in one's ministry. Did you know that our viewers can get a uh, discount just for them on their next stole order from Jeff One Row Designs? I did. I wrote this script. And you read the memos from Jeff. <laughs> uh, friends, those of you that are at home watching this now or later, you can go to Jeff One Row Designs and enter the code two on one, all one word, uh, at checkout for 15% off your next stole order. That's a substantial discount. It is a substantial discount, Arthur, and just in time for the last few days of Clergy Appreciation Month. So uh, we would like to thank our generous sponsor, Jeff One Row Designs, and invite you all, our viewers, to visit jeffonerow.com, that's J-E-F-F, w-u-n-r-o-w.com today to see their full catalog of stoles and clergy apparel and customization op options. Well done. I gave you all the hard stuff in that script. You did. Uh, welcome to Two on One. For those of you joining us, I'm the Reverend Arthur Stewart, joined by the Reverend Stephanie Kendall. Uh, it is a talk show in which theology and pop culture combine, even though they're already together. Ooh, spooky. I'm going to bring in our guest. Uh, we're so excited about this. And uh, please help me welcome the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler, who is joining us from Washington, D.C. All right. Hey, everyone. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. You know, things are um, real boring in this city right now. Nothing much going on. So Seems appropriate. For, uh, I think everyone probably knows you at this point, but do you want to give our listeners a little uh, insight into who you are and what you're doing right now? Sure. Uh, so my name is, is Amy, and I <clears throat> had the great honor of being the senior pastor across town at Calvary Baptist Church for 11 years. Then I went on to the Riverside Church in Manhattan for five, and I am back now here in Washington, D.C., as the interim senior minister at National City Christian Church, which is the national church of the disciples, as you know. And um, I'll be here for two years as they're searching for their next permanent pastor. And I'm having a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, like this is, I've okay, so today we're talking about what the constitution means to me. 
for those of you who have not seen it, it is a play by Heidi Schreck. Shrek, yes. Am I saying the? Pardon. It's it's almost it's like a one and a half woman show. Like she she has a co-star who and he's a man and it's it's a narrative and it's 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 this opening of her life and her heart and soul and it's on Amazon Prime and if you haven't watched it you need to watch it probably before Tuesday, dear viewers, um, especially because of the last few days. But anyhow, we're talking about this today. Why did you pick this uh, show? Well, well, first of all, it's so good. I took my daughter to see it and there's a lot of references to Dirty Dancing in, in the show. So like, if you weren't like um, alive in the 1980s or 90s, you might have um, some, she was just looking confused a lot of the time, but I- references. She, she didn't have the time of her life owing it all to you? Not. I mean- <laughs> When she talked about like um, troubled dance instructors in the Poconos, like I just, I just loved it. Anyway, um, Patrick Swayze. Uh, but I have been, I've spent the last six years really thinking a lot about how we speak of our faith and the political world um, in the same breath. And I think Christians, especially progressive Christians, have been notoriously bad at this. And um, as you know, the last four years in particular have gotten very intense on many, many issues that directly impact how we think about our faith and how we think about living in this world. And so ramping up to this, I've been delivering lectures, I've been writing things, I've been talking as much as I can about why it's imperative for people of faith to be voting and thinking about our lives through the lens of our faith. And here we are, you know, a few days before Tuesday, and it seems even more important now than ever. So um, I I, I, this play is, is amazing. And it was one of my favorite things that I saw on Broadway when I lived in New York. And so it seems even more important, as you say now, than it was before. I beg your pardon. I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to mute myself for a moment while the phone rings in my office that I can't. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I saw it twice. At, and I, I'm with you. I think that it is it's a testament to what we lose when we don't fund the arts. And right now with the poor management of uh, the economy and the way in which we are situated, I think that uh, with Broadway being shut down and, uh, and the stories that aren't being told right now, I think are affecting the way in which we relate and understand um, and grow in this uh, space together, especially as we need to make informed and important decisions with our ballots that affect each other. And I'm wondering, uh, I don't know, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on what are we missing right now when we, when we don't have spaces like Broadway or just like theater writ large in these communities? Um, what are we missing uh, in this conversation? I'm just feeling a lot of like um, Lord of the Flies kind of feeling, you know, at least I have a job. So, you know, so-and-so got furloughed or whatever. And that's just not a good place for our society to be, you know? Um, I think the arts in the same way that the church, when it's being its best self, um, exists in the world, offers a place for us to tell and own our stories and to um, understand a collective story as human beings. And we're just missing that because we're sitting at home, you know, waiting for Uber Eats and um, missing that connection. And of course we have Zoom and everything, but um, just the, what, what we understand as, as tenders of um, faith community, just such the gift that faith community gives us um, that the um, opportunity, the forum for telling my own story, for, for being known, and then for understanding my story within the larger story of, of God's um, work in the world. And it's such a loss. We um, here at National City, there's these huge steps going up the front that are really beautiful. And 
um, one of our goals for the next year will be to have as much art as we can on those front steps, just to make us feel human again. Well, and there's, there's something to be said about dehumanization when we lose the arts. And um, sorry, I, I, I almost interjected on that with, with not giving relief to arts orgs. There's 100,000 people, more or less, like directly full-time employed in arts orgs, I think just in New York City, and there's 50,000 coal miners still active in this country. But we talk more about the coal owner or coal miners as if that's, sorry, I have opinions that aren't necessarily, it's all theology and it's not theology. Um, you're both looking at me like I'm a moron. And that's all right. No, I'm just, uh, I, I think you were hitting on something on like- I, Well, we're, our priorities, um, our priorities are to keep people alone and afraid. It feels like the last few years. The more separate I can keep you and the more us versus them I can keep you, the more I can either manipulate you or make you the enemy. Sitting in the same room, I, I'll tell you what immediately hit me like a ton of bricks was I flashed back to speech and debate when I did it in high school because the entire show was built like, like a, it, it was absolutely it reeked of the NFL, the National Forensics League in the 1990s. Like it was beautiful and terrifying. You know, but that then it was like, oh man, where's that community? And I wonder how Sean is doing and Hari and, and Francis. And there's all these people I sat in high schools on Saturdays with and waited for results and quarterfinals. And what else was that deep sense of longing that was in that audience? By the way, I don't know if you knew Amy, but Spiff is visible in the recording uh, that is on Amazon Prime. I took my turn. Uh, yeah, okay. With a bona fide <laughs> movie star. Uh, my, I took my young adult group, my YAS group to go see the, what the constitution means to me. And the day we went was the day of the filming. And so within 14 seconds, literally I counted it, uh, there, it pans across like in the entire row of us, you only see my shoulder, which is kind of a bummer, but like my office administration, many of our elders, like this is an entire group of Park Avenue Christian church people within like the first 40 seconds. And then we're seen throughout the entire, uh, show. <laughs> That's so funny. I I always knew I needed to get your autograph. <laughs> get on that. I'll give it to you someday. We'll see. Yeah, uh, I like in rewatching it in particular. I had some serious flashbacks to um, speech competitions that I was in. What in, was your event? In high, or, I, I did poetry. Yeah, I did uh, poetry. I also remember competing for a scholarship uh, where I had to go in and talk about um, current events. And I had a letter printed in the Honolulu Star Bulletin expressing my outrage about Oliver North. I hope I have a copy of it somewhere. <laughs> Or if you're like, if you're like on um, the show where she was like, my mom kept a bag of my hair, but throughout my prize winning speech. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I feel like that, I, I, I felt that deep in my bones. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of things. But yeah, then, like, the, like that whole earnestness of, 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 of thinking, you know, the constitution will keep us safe. And like, I, I have such optimism about who we can be as a country and yeah, yeah. Well, well so what do we, oh, Arden, you wanna go? No, please, 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 please. So my, I, 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 as I clearly write all my questions now in every episode, um, I have one that I think uh, touches on what we're talking about here is, you know, uh, the earnestness that comes when one is vulnerable to tell their story uh, and what we learn from that. And so what can we learn from Heidi Schreck's vulnerability in telling her stories truthfully? And why do we as churches, do you think, um, shy away from telling our historical truths? Mm -hmm. um, and, and right now, I think there's a real connection and need for that. Right. You know, that's the power and beauty of this show, and she does it so very well. You know, she tells her own story sort of as a foil for um, this, this wide-eyed view of the Constitution and how we live together. And um, that's what draws us in, you know. We find um, parallels between her story and our own, and um, I think that she just does that so well. That's why I would 
would put church in the same category as as Broadway and certainly as this play. I mean, um, it it's a, a it's one of the few places where we can tell our story. And unfortunately, we have um, shepherded the institution in such a way that it also has mirrored our secular institutions and we can't fully be vulnerable because you know what happens when you're vulnerable you weakness stabbed in the back mm -hmm. um and um you know you know as well as i do so many people have been burned by church and um i would count myself in that category and it's hard to pick yourself up and keep at it but there's something about telling your story and hearing the stories of others that that um that fleshes out your humanity oh that's good <laughs> wow that'll preach uh, man i wish i was in a speech competition right now right i vote for you uh no i think yeah i think that there is the vulnerability is both necessary and and the 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 primary current challenge i think for many of us because it puts us in a space to to be knocked down in ways that uh we are used to and yet are hopeful won't continue well um, that's what we're trying to build something that's sort of like the reflection of god's best hopes for humanity and so if we don't keep at it, then we're, we're, you know, giving into the desperation around us and we can't do that. When we talked about uh, Schitt's Creek, it was uh, the reign of God ended up being kind of defined as the world, living into the world as it can be, not the world as it is. And theater does the same thing in church on its best days, tries to, but. Mm. I also think that um, one of the reasons I think the church will never die, it'll just be uh, formed in a different expression, is that we need a place to ask the hard questions about what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And the theater does this too, you know? The best pieces in theater do this. And so in a way we have that in common as well. So I'd like to ask a question, if I could, about um, interpretation. Um, number one, I just want to note in Wichita, Kansas, at a, uh, dropping my kid off from school and driving to the church, it's like a mile and a half. And there is a sign that I'm going to buy stickers of commas and exclamation points because they have three of them in their yard and it says Jesus 2020. And I figure if it becomes Jesus comma 2020 exclamation point, I won't get so mad as I drive by. <laughs> Um, that's awesome but they've um well, well, with the constitution there's been a lot of talk about originalists about we have to somehow get into the mindset of of mostly white or white all white southern male slave holding planter class people and then decide how the constitution works from there we also incorporate or not incorporate we encounter literalism in scripture that apparently, however, the Bible was hand delivered in English, uh, King James English to Jesus Christ is how we must therefore interpret scripture also. Or as a friend of mine once said to me, uh, you interpret scripture, I just read it. And I was like, oh, your brain though is connected to your eyes and there's synapses. And what do, we, what do we do with interpretation in the church? How do we do that together? How do we make room or do we make room for literalists or originalists or right yeah. you know I, all right i understand that in the legal profession you know language must be precise and and all of those things but i i think with an ancient document as we are living in the church um we have to decide who it is we want to be um, sort of writ large as people, right? And and then we we have to hold up the written word next to this ideology that we're trying to live into, um, because as we know, humans are flawed. So I just feel like, you know, I would say we at the end of the day, the tiebreaker is the words of Jesus, right? For Christians. Um, 
I don't know how we do that in secular society. And I think it's something that, that this current moment is forcing us to think about, like, who do we want to be as a society? Because a lot of the questions about what the constitution means uh, can be answered with a clear answer to that question. Um, I just don't know how we would ever get there with the institutions that we have and the way they currently are. I mean, I love that line uh, in the show that says that she's talking about um, Amendment 9 that says it leaves room for the understanding that who we are now is not who we might be, or is not who we might become or something along those lines. And, and I think that that's really true uh, when we take into account the still speaking word of God, right? That like the, the reason we utilize that tool in scripture is to point us towards something better pointing us towards who we uh who god hopes we will become here's the tools and the uh the messaging and the way in which to do it like here it is uh if you only have enough you know if you only have ears to hear uh the stories of other people and how you are connected to them and how you are connected to god through them and so um i really you know, agree. i think stephanie i think that's why i stay in the church i think because um, you know, I, w I was reading um, the eulogy for um, RBG that her rabbi gave, and there's this beautiful line that she says toward the end that um, RBG's dissent or disagreement with um, things she thought were unlawful or um, uncharitable or whatever was that um, these are um, blueprints of the future. And, you know, I, I think the, the hard work that we do to move institutions to new expressions, to follow the wind of God's spirit, even though we don't like change, to take all the hits that you take as leaders of institutions when you try to do this is because I hope after I'm gone, somebody will say she laid out some blueprints for the future, you know? Um, we, we, there's no hope for us if people aren't willing to do that. Well, and we, we surrender hope so easily nowadays. Yes. 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 So marvelous. Spiff, I know you have a question and forgive me. I'm... No, go for it. So I, uh, I've been thinking about at the end of this, at the end of this play, um, I think it's so cool. Um, is it Holly or Heidi? Why can I not remember her first name? Excuse me. Heidi, Heidi. Heidi Shrek brings out a uh, teenager who does parliamentary style debate, which was not a thing that was around when I did forensics. And they debate whether or not the constitution should be uh, abolished or not. And they do a coin toss to decide who does which side and it's super competitive. And I wonder if Heidi Shrek's an Enneagram three. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm in a room with two threes. We're in the triad of progressive <laughs> personalities. Be um, afraid. Oh, I, I'm, married three. I'm married to three wing four. Like, oh, I'm, okay. I'm set. Uh, but before we get to, should the constitution be abolished, uh, within that, let's talk about our scripture. If I could, I, I just have a hypothetical I want to play with, if that's all right. If uh, the 66 books of the Bible are before amendments, what amendments should we add to the canon of scripture? That is, what should be added and what should be taken away? It doesn't have to be comprehensive. <laughs> Who do you think I am, Martin Luther? <laughs> yep. What's your epistle of straw? Uh, it's almost Reformation Day. This is appropriate. Well, I think what what people who think about this and talk about this don't admit, and so I will just admit it, is that we have a personal dog in the fight, you know, like certain kind, certain parts of scripture speak to us more uh, deeply than others. Um, I will, I don't, I don't know the answer to your question, but I will c take this moment to confess that um, I rarely rarely preach on the epistles and there's several reasons for that um the first being that you know paul and i have 
um, a few disagreements from time to time. And um, no. I feel like he's caused a lot of pain and angst in my life and I'm pretty pissed about it. Um, so I'm working through that. But then also, I just, I think these epistles are the upper, are, are just sort of like the, the church minutes of the early church, right? And anytime we try to, um, you know, take w one situation and then lay it on top of another, sort of imposing the strictures of that situation on onto another, it it's well, that's just ignorant, and it's it's not um, it's not a good way to live in community and to govern our life together. And it certainly isn't nuanced in the way of Jesus and the way we understand that God works in the world. So I will say that I don't think Paul and all those guys meant that meant to cause all this trouble, but um, I I just have a lot of trouble with the epistles. That's just me. You're not the, I think I have a weekly line in here about me and Paul not not aligning um, in certain ways. So. And it's usually yeah. because I bring up, I've been deep studying First Corinthians and uh, I'm an apologist for the authentic Paul, but not always, um, especially because like, you were writing in Greece and you couldn't use one of the like 50 words for homosexual acts that they had. You had to create something new that we're going to argue about for 2,000 years. Like the ancient Greeks invented about homosexuality. Anything, I mean, it's just, yeah, crazy. Uh, so when should we, I guess, uh, uh, when should we uh, uh, kind of discuss our governing documents then? Because for the church, we have most of us have some sort of a constitution and bylaws. Uh, and yet we also then turn towards the Bible as our governing document. And so um, yeah, I, I think I said it last week or two weeks ago that sometimes I think there uh, we lean too far into the idolatry of tradition rather than understanding what the traditional act we are called to perform uh, brings value to or does. Um, and I think that sometimes uh, we lean too hard. I think that that's true for us in the framers and the U.S. Constitution, um, and I'm wondering how, I mean, and this is a question to all of us, what do we do with then these governing documents that our churches have um, that we let just sit in the corner and, you know, we look at them usually around congregational meetings or things like that, but uh, other than that, um, do they serve us? And so what is our responsibility to them and to, as faith leaders to our people, um, to use those documents and or to highlight the way in which Heidi does for our U.S. Constitution, the ways in which this document actually doesn't serve the people. <laughs> this reminds me of my first pastorate at Calvary. I was 32 years old and I, um, of course, knew uh, exactly how to do the job. And I remember thinking it was strange um, when I first got there that church members came to church on Sunday mornings with copies of the constitution and bylaws of the church, like dog-eared and highlighted and written on. And uh, like, these people did not have their Bibles with them. Oh no. And, you know, as I should have known, um, and I do now for sure, that ended up uh, being like sort of the precursor to some really serious congregational conflict, because when our in, when our our documents, our founding documents, become the end all and be all, then um, we don't mind trampling over each other to prove our point, and that's just um, both in our country and in our churches, it's it's a waste of time, and so I you know. I'm one who, you know, I preach the lectionary mostly because I like having the structure and I teach the Bible because I think it's a, a flawed book that is, is an incredible conversation partner for us as modern people of faith. But those things should never be um, the most important thing about who we are as a community. 
I think uh, I read Sarah Miles's Take the Spread this week, and God, she has some lines that I just had to set it down and just be like, mm -hmm. and at one point she says the word of God she quotes someone else the word of God is not the scripture that is read it is the what happens when scripture is read to a community it's again nuance and for originalists and literalists there's no room for nuance um well so the irony of this is that I think that most people don't know their bibles mm -hmm. even people go to church all the time do not know their I mean like evangelicals in america like that's a perfect and people people don't read their bibles and so um i i really feel like it's it's like the holy responsibility of those of us who steward congregations to keep pushing our people back into the text you know to have them um engage the text constantly i always say like um you are biblical scholars you know we're doing the work of worship together take out your bibles and turn to whatever whatever i want you to read it you know because i think a lot of people find uh the bible intimidating and if we don't if we don't encourage our people to engage the text in an honest way we're going to end up with a whole bunch of sheep who are being fed whatever happens to be popular in the moment and Jesus becomes a fetish object, not somebody to transform into. Um, there's, have you seen the, uh, there's the gentleman, speaking of the intersection of church and, and constitution, it's, it's um, he's, oh, he's a worship leader from um, Hillsong, is that right? He's, he's doing these like, we need the freedom of worship. So he's having these super spreader events in cities across the country, Sean Fuked, or I say it a different way in my head, and worship then becomes about the individual's experience and, and, and encounter of great emotion as opposed to what is actually just and appropriate. But I'm sure there was a question, but I completely botched it. My apologies, Amy. It's something I do every No, day. you're just going to make me like get on my soapbox about uh, clergy malpractice um, because, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I think I can parlay that you're sticking out there into a question. Um, so is there a separation of church and state and why should federal law be a conversation partner for churches? <laughs> oh, I'm a Baptist. So I love talking about church and state. And of course, separation of church and state is one of the founding principles of, uh, the Baptist expression of Christian faith. And so this is something that is very important to me. And it's very important that we get it right because the separation of church and state was not put into place to protect the government. <laughs> the separation of church and state was put in place to protect us, people of faith and all people of faith so that we have the free practice of our religion. It's to keep the government away from our religious practice. So, I think when you use the separation of church and state as um, an excuse not to talk about what is going on in our society, you, you're committing malpractice or that's just, um, you're taking the easy way out because you know all politics is, is the, how we run our corporate life. And if I've been saying this over and over these past weeks, but if we, if we don't look at how we run our corporate life through the lens of our faith, then what are we doing? Like, it's, you know, and so we should be talking about politics. Of course we should. We should be interrogating the way that our policies order our life together. And I will say that and this is not a word I use a lot, but I felt after the election in 2016, a big sense of um, the need to repent. Like, because I was just bopping along, not really paying attention to much that was going on um, and just sort of assuming that things were going well. We are after all the United States of America. And, you know, people of faith should have always been interrogating um, our structures and our policies and our laws through the lens of our faith, always. Well, and I think on the left-hand side of the spectrum in churches, one, 
I will say it's it's been my experience in some congregations, and I know it's shared amongst plenty of people that um, you're being political when said by congregants to the pastor is you are questioning the de facto stance of the GOP, which is prevalent in our congregation for the most part. Um, with the political somehow the big right wing leaders like my dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Robert Jeffress won't return my calls super weird. He's going to show up on Fox News and overtly defend bad practice by um, an administration that supports his political. It's we, we, we uh, seeded the political realm because of the evangelical movement and uh, evangelicalist movement that's probably better and and we we're afraid to even try to, to try to take it back i don't understand why the disciples aren't whole hog fully every congregation behind william barber right now i he, he's the biggest thing to happen to the disciples since jim jones and it's so much better um <laughs> I'm sure he'd be really stoked for that tagline. Oh, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call Steve Knight and be like, "Got a new, got a new one for you." <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same fun. way about National City. Like, you know, um, I I understand that the days of building cathedrals are gone are gone, but this is the only free church cathedral in this city. Like, disciples have the only free church cathedral in Washington D.C. So, so you are poised not only to speak to the matter, matters at hand, but also to be a place where other expressions of the free church can come and engage the political dialogue. It's, it's, it's critically important. One of my favorite things that I did this at Calvary about 12 years ago, and then I also did it at Riverside, um, preach a sermon called The Greatest Sermon Ever Preached, in which I just read the um, Sermon on the Mount from the message. And both times that I've done that, I've been nailed for being too political. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesus was also nailed for being too political. Oh, right. And so uh, this is what I always tell people, like, you're, you're getting criticism for being too political. You like, these are the words of Jesus. Well, but who are you trying to follow? Jesus is a great is a great guy who like wants us to be happy. Um, and therapeutic moral deism is like he he wants us to just do what's nice. Again, malpractice. Oh, fully. Please, I'm 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 quoting. Uh, oh, what's her? I, I cannot remember anybody's first names today. I'm sorry about that, Susan Abigail. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. <sighs> spiritual uh, and faith leadership malpractice and uh, the malpractice of those who are called to serve as we have seen over and over again, primarily recently. Um, the hypocrisy that accompanies leadership in this country is uh, sinful. Um, and so, you know, we are, we're given the opportunity this coming week to exercise our uh, our humanity and uh, be a part of our citizenry and and given an opportunity to participate in the livelihood and life of who we deem as our neighbor, whether or not we actually name them as such or not. Uh, and so why is it important? Uh, you know, I think all of our energies need to be focused on getting people to the polls, right? And getting people to vote. And so why is it important that we talk about this as leaders, as faith leaders, uh, particularly. And I think that it, it does a little bit harken back to our understanding of taking back what it means to be religious, who gets to be religious in this country. Um, but I want to I highlight, uh, if we do anything on this show this week, uh, the importance of, of this gift that is, um, that is the privilege of being able to vote. Um, yes. So what should we be doing? How, how you know, what's our message to the listeners out here who may who may say, I live in a state like New York or California or Texas traditionally, although Texas is in play, y'all. Um, but like, you know, that that my vote doesn't count. What do we say to those people who who think that their vote their vote doesn't count because they are just one of the sheep, one of the flock that, you know, is being has already been tended to, let's say. Mm. Well, I think a couple of things. Um, the last three weeks, lectionary assignments, 
are just kicking this conversation in the teeth. It's just Jesus in the last week of his life going around Jerusalem, uh, like having conversations about what it means to be a faithful citizen. And so again, you know, if you're having trouble, just pull out your Bible and the words of Jesus, you know. Um, the second thing I think is that it's our holy opportunity in this moment to teach our people that um, engagement in po politics, our corporate life, is a holy act. It's an act of faith. And particularly this week where there's the physical act of going and standing in line and putting your ballot in and all of that. I mean, we, we can help people understand that as a holy act. Um, an, an act of devotion, an act of, um, you know, um, commitment to our faith and, you know, framed in that way, it doesn't matter whether, whether our vote counts or doesn't count. Like I'm doing this because I believe the words of Jesus who said, I need to love my neighbor as myself. And politics is the way that we institutionalize this in our human society. So it is an act of faith for me to be having a say in how we conduct our political life. How's that a line outside your window, Spiff? They're great. I, I was telling Arthur now, like uh, the early voting uh, that is happening in, uh, in New York, there is a consistent line outside of my window all day long, which is problematic that we should not actually have these barriers and make it way easier for people to vote. And yet I am inspired by their, their commitment to this rainy, you know, day outside of New York. And they're going to wait for hours. Uh, the other on Sunday after worship, I watched one woman make it from one side of my window to the other, and it took her almost an hour. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there's commitment and there is, that is the truth, like that is the gospel at work. That is the like looking at these people and you know, my, uh, one of the things that I do just daily, uh, my, tr my treadmill's right here at this window. So I get on it for my own personal health and anybody that walks by, I pray for them. I just pray kind of these writ large prayers that like God is doing something new in their life that, you know, that they're just, they're healthy, they're protected because I don't know who they are, but here are some really kind of overarching things that I hope are a part of that, you know, person's life. And uh, my prayers have been tenfold over because I have just so many people in that window right now and all of this. And, and my hope for them is that they know that what they're doing matters, um, that that's part of the ways in which my prayers have changed this week, that like, that they don't find that regardless of the outcome of this election, that what they did in this moment matters. Um, and I think that for me that, you know, goes back, I came to religion late, I, you know, later than some of my peers. Uh, and one of the things that has always stuck with me is the fact that we as a community, as a reading community of those last days of Jesus had the opportunity to save him, to vote in a way that saved his life. Uh, and we did not take that opportunity. And so we now, voting is a real act of engagement with our scriptures, with our relationship to Jesus, with our relationship to God through everyone else. And, and we get there through scripture. We don't get there through partisan, you know, diatribes of what, you know, who, who you're, who you're uh, protecting and who you're following and all of that, but that this moment in and of itself is an act that ties us to Jesus and ties us to our understanding of justice in these moments yeah and i would also say like um it is very tempting in life and in this current moment to allow fear and hopelessness to win and i think you know jesus invited us to embrace our human living with courage and to not give into the fear because when, when we do, we're selfish and grasping and we forget about our neighbor. And so it takes a lot of courage to show up and, and to bat back the hopelessness and fear. Courage is, courage is an act of hope or hope is an act of courage. I forget which. Um, pardon, I was double clicking to make sure nobody invades this space and 
I, by the way, and I'm sorry, I'm in Sedgwick County, Kansas, uh, Wichita, home of, and uh, it's the air capital of the world. I don't know if you guys knew that, but now you do. Uh, with with our voting, I'm working at the polls and speaking to hope and to courage and the, the idea that people matter in that. Uh, I will say that Sedgwick County, they're like, if the person can vote, they should vote. Like, we'll figure it out. Make any, not exception, but like provisional ballots. We have 8,000 ways a person can cast a vote, even if they think they already have voted. That's not going to incur voter fraud. I, pardon me. No, it's important that we all, like there are many ways in which we are called to act in this moment. Voting is one of them, but encouraging others to do so. You know, if you are able to work the polls, you know, there, there's so a lot of ways be, in which to do this. Uh, and that when we also have biblical um, narratives that support, you know, our act in this participation, so. So what does a courageous church look like on November 3rd? And what does it look like on November 4th? <laughs> I've made a new friend here in DC who's an Episcopalian priest and she told me that she always used to um, sort of look down on National City because she would walk by and instead of a, a cross on the top of the church there's a like a what are they called wind yeah, weather vane. weather vane yeah right and it turns <laughs> it turns right does it have a rooster on it it does not have a rooster oh. but um she she said she always used to think like um those guys they don't have the courage to put an actual cross on the top of their building and she said you know um my view on that has changed because here's this weather vane shaped like a cross and it's turning with the wind and isn't that who we're called to be in this world as God's people? Because we serve this God that is ever creating, that is always inviting us into something new. And what would happen if the church had the courage to go there? If the church had the courage to not be the last person in line when it comes to advocating for issues of justice, but like out front agitating and, you know, forcing change that needs to happen. Um, I hope that, uh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not scared. I'm not scared, but I'm, I'm feeling, um, concerned about what is going to happen in this city on Tuesday and in the days following. It's really freaky here right now. They, there are military helicopters flying very low over the city, um, in the evenings and it, it it's just not it doesn't I don't know I don't know um but it's constant and it doesn't it doesn't feel good it doesn't sound good and um I think you know if violence does break out and if the breach in our community is so large that it exhibits itself in that way the church needs to be ready to step up to be um a place of peace and and comfort and solace and and to hold out the opportunity and the dream of, you know, um, constructive and healthy community. You know, if we can't do it in our society, man, that's, that's even more work for the church to step up and show us how to do it. Amen. Arthur, you have something to just can we can we give the extremists Florida? Like, can we just say to all of the people who are like, I'm gonna wander around with assault rifles and stand outside polling places, probably with a flag that promotes a particular candidate, can we just give them Florida and say, like, hey, citizens of Miami, if you want to move, we'll help facilitate it, whatever, and just let them drown in their own self-righteousness and their weird conflict. And I know that's not loving, and I know it's not Christian, and it's almost not a serious question, but can we not just... I think we can't, and I think that that's part of, the, you know, what, what in the to use a phrase that we use here at the park, the divinity of diversity. I think that, like, when we fully, we, we need to start valuing everyone uh, because I think that what we don't do and where, what's out of that conversation and why we think we want to kind of, you know, uh, place certain ideologies in one certain place so we know how to address them is that 
we are in converse, we're in deep conversation with our communities uh, because it's the non-voters, it's the people that feel like they don't have a voice that uh, we aren't lifting up into this dialogue and centering that experience. We're rather saying these really loud people need to go over here. And I think yeah. that uh, I think that we are better served when we actually lift up uh, and lift in uh, voices that have been uh, pushed out uh, regardless of where they fall. Because when you're in that type of deep communal conversation, I think that there's no place to go but forward with each other. We've how we've gotten so far apart is that we've stopped those interconnected kind of con conversations and said, I'm going to see this person as my neighbor, but in the act of doing that, I'm going to allow myself to not see this person as my neighbor. And that's how white supremacy has spread. That is how, you know, anti-black violence has spread. And so I think that that is part of, part of the work that we are called to do in this moment is to say, you know, to cast these more expansive visions and say, we all have to come together because democracy dies in that silence and in that uh, in those shadows uh, in a way in which does not serve us, does not serve the kingdom of hope that we hope to be building. So yeah, but unlike every other type of separation, mine is correct. Like mine's just and holy, and it's a very well. Good see, thing. here's where the church has some something to say about this because I have a whole list of like deacons, personnel committee members, church council members that I would prefer if they just moved to Florida. You know? um, but we're all thrown in this mess together and we got to figure out a way to make it work. Yep. I had a conversation with someone in my community. Um, whenever I rant on Facebook, I'm, I, I'm teaching some folk. I'm their pastor, not their mascot. Um, and it, it, it takes some good boundaries. And the other day I posted... Um, I'm worried about the future of LGBTQ, uh, the, the community and marriage equality. And if you want to get married right now, I will do it. I will drive to you and do it. Um, and I put at the end of it, like, if this is the time for you to say, Arthur, you're overreacting, you are not correct. It's not the time for you to say that, especially if the Supreme Court has never ruled as to you having full rights. Um, and somebody was talking to me about it and they said, we think you know, you're, you're overreacting also though, the Supreme Court hasn't ever ruled on the legitimacy of my marriage, so I'm going to shut up. And I thought, well, that's a step. Mm -hmm. They're on my Florida list still, but <laughs> that, that's a new thing, by the way. I'm going to just add that to the lexicon. Uh, we are. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for that word of hope, both of you, because I'm, I'm scared. Who isn't? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do think we are at where, you know, to recognize time. And Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it is always a, uh, it is always fun talking to you. Um, we should do it more. Uh, we should. We should. Uh, anyways, but as you know, our final question is the only one that is scripted of this conversation. And that question, and you will get to answer first, is what biblical character, theme, narrative, uh, by, you know, just kind of- Motif. Oh, yeah, theme, motif of the Bible are you most reminded of in Heidi Shrek's What the Constitution Means to Me? Okay, so before I answer this, I just want to do say another plug for, for this show. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, it's so good. so good, and you just need to watch it this week, um, especially if you're a Patrick Swayze fan. Um, if you're not a Patrick that Swayze is the fan, demographic. The demographic. you need to move to Florida. The, the demographic is 1,000% Patrick Swayze fans. Yeah, like you're on the Florida list if you're not a Patrick Swayze fan, fan and you don't want that. Right, right. But everybody else should watch it too. Um, so as I was re-watching it, I kept thinking of the story that none of us like to preach from Matthew chapter 15 about the Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus with her demon-possessed daughter. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm full. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm here to serve, serve Jewish people. And she says, you know, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall to the ground. And that might not be so positive, but it's really what um, the play evoked in me, just the desperate voices of those in our society who do not have a place at the table. And how um, Heidi's journey through the Constitution helped her understand the plight and the voices of those who, who 
who are under the table looking for the crumbs. And if there's anything that we're called to do in this moment is to, to make a society where everybody can thrive, where we don't have to cry on a stage on Broadway about um, lack of basic human rights. So that's what I really thought of as I was rewatching the show. Hmm. I also had something for Matthew. It was the genealogy. Um, in my home office, I have, uh, actually it's something I, I don't even remember the name of the program, but it's the genealogy of Jesus and Matthew presents it as, is it three sets of like 17 and it's begats, but he highlights some stories and he picks some others that he has a different lineage than is presented in any of the lineages in the Hebrew Bible because he's intentionally telling a story and interpreting it and building something new. And that sets Jesus up then as the successor of Moses, not super succeeder, just anyhow, it's, it's knowing the history has to inform the interpretation, knowing that it's interpreted means that there has to be an agenda, but that agenda is pointing us on a trajectory which um, I think that was part of the blueprints thing uh, you had spoken of earlier. So what story from Matthew do you feel uh, it is, Biff? Shocking that I did not choose a story from Matthew. <laughs> um, I have Heidi as the prophet Hulda, um, that, that all of these men you know, are like, what do we do with the law? How do we interpret it? We don't know. And then they go to Hulda um, to interpret this law. And so for me, that is really what this this show does is it, it interprets this document that a lot of us don't know what to do with and yet we go to this one woman who has a very particular understanding of this law and how it has affected her and how we are called to use that understanding to uh, act in a way that we know will affect others in our future and so uh, I just really saw as I was reading that passage um, that that the way in which Heidi was was calling us to to look at these documents, interpret them in good faith for kind of all people, um, really reminded me of Hulda. And then I had the Constitution itself and its penumbras as uh, a working of the Holy Spirit. That there is that it offers room to uh, engage in the not yet known, um, which I think is a huge part of when we actually allow the Spirit to move. That what she can do. Those were my answers. Oh, well, the Constitution itself, if we get to play that. Uh, I'm going to go 1 Corinthians 14, because that's what I'm studying right now. And all of that talk about tongues, uh, speaking of tongues and the ordering of it and intelligible discourse and the gifts of the Spirit, it's working out like how things are. Um, and it's speaking to like, it's not a blueprint of how we have to do things right now. Really, it's a, what Paul is asking, what are we doing? Not the two verses, by the way, in chapter 14 that were a later insertion that are complete garbage and should be taken out of all future versions of scripture. Uh, I'm totally fine with that. Forget the canon. The canon's useless. Um, okay, well, this has been two on one. Uh, Amy, thank you a thousand times, 100,000 times for coming and talking with us about the show, what the Constitution means to me, again, available on Amazon Prime. I'm going to share my screen for one moment because we are sponsored by Jeff Wanro Designs, celebrating 15 years of making ordinary time extraordinary. I am so mad at how good that motto is. Check out jeffwanro.com, please. Um, and we talked about it more about them more at the top of the hour. Um, and next week, uh, we are in we are in conversation with the Reverend Terry Horde Owens, the general minister and president of the Disciples, uh, and we are going to talk Sister Act. And so, uh, very excited about that. Uh, hoping you all a uh, an ease of voting and an urgency of this call to democracy. Uh, and if you can't get your vote in, call me, I will help you figure it out. Let's uh, get everyone out there to vote uh, because uh, our life depends on it. Know the numbers of the people who are going to stop folks who are poll watching, but instead engaging in intimidation. Uh, if you are in a polling place, by the time it closes, you can vote no matter how long the line is, no matter how late it is going. And please only vote once, but vote well. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. And this has been Two on One, the internet's top sensation. 
On behalf of the Reverend Stephanie Kendall and myself, I am the Reverend Arthur Stewart. Uh, please like, subscribe, share, argue, contact us, do as you will, and also make sure to go to jeffwunro.com, J-E-F-F-W-U-N-R-O-W.com. Get 15% off your entire stole order when you use our discount code, two on one, those are letters, one five, those are digits, at checkout for 15% off every single stole you buy. It's the best deal out there because you're the best deuces out there. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Get more two-on-one at twoononeproject.com.